Did you enjoy that? I did. And I'm sure that the angels as well and God, when little children sing praises to him. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you so much to the Waldrop family for the scripture reading. And so I invite you to, to, to turn there to Daniel chapter 2. <coughs> Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, if you have been coming to the meetings, you have uh, heard Pastor Michael talking about this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had and what God did to interpret it through Daniel. And even though Daniel was in a foreign land, was in Babylon, God was with him. Even though we are in Babylon, God is with us. Daniel was faithful to God, and so I encourage you to be faithful to God as well. There in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, it says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image was splendor, was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thigh of bronze, its legs of iron and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Now look at verse 36. Here he gives interpretation. This is a dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whatever the children of men and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the fields and the birds of heaven, He has given them into your hands and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of what? This head of gold. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And so now, who is, who is this, this head of gold? It's Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible tells us, Daniel tells them, you are this head of gold. That's you. The image had four metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And Nebuchadnezzar was really impressed. You can see it there in verse 46. In verse 46. Chapter 2, verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face. Don't miss that. This is the king. And he falls on his face. He's used to having people fall on their face be, be, before him. But he is so impressed that he falls on his face, prostrates before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering an instance to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this dream. He was impressed with what God had done. Let's bow our heads as we ask God for his spirit one more time. Father in heaven, please open our minds and please come into our minds and, to, and into our Decision making in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. He is impressed. Have you ever been impressed with something with how God has worked in your life, or maybe in a life that somebody is close to you? You've seen the finger of God that you just know, wow, that's that is the power of God. 
But Nebuchadnezzar has an idea, and there we go to chapter 3, verse 1. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Even though he was impressed with what Daniel did, with what God did through Daniel, and recognizes your God is really the, the true God. In chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it, uh, it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Friends, it's not enough to just be impressed with what God does or how we see God work. You have to be content with what God says. We may be impressed how God works in our lives, see miracles in our lives, uh, see miracles in other people's lives. The whole story of the children of Israel was an, is an impression that left you with your jaw dropped if you were there. To see the Red Sea parted. Talk about giving an impression. To see then the Red Sea close on the Egyptians. To see food, manna fall down from heaven. To see the walls of Jericho come down. But yet, the people were not content with what God had said. We can be impressed by God, friends, but it is not enough to be impressed by God. You have to be content with whatever God says. With whatever is written in His Word. Nebuchadnezzar was just the head of gold. He may not have said it verbally, but with his actions, with his actions, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I don't like what God says. I don't like the way the Bible is written. I don't, I don't like the, 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 the interpretation that, that Daniel here, that, that God is saying. I don't like that part that says, but after you, another kingdom inferior to yours. I, I don't like that part. So I'm going to change it. Nebuchadnezzar, like, like so many, decided to rewrite the Bible to suit his own beliefs and his own desires. Do you see that in the text? It's clear, I hope, I hope you see it in the text. Daniel gives the interpretation and even gives what each metal represents. Yes, you are the head of gold, but I'm sorry to say, somebody else is going to come after you, and then somebody else, and then somebody else. And then in chapter 3, he says, I'm going to make the whole image of gold. So I will last from top to bottom forever. He decides to rewrite what God had said to fit his own beliefs, his own desires, his own views. Friends, are we ever guilty? of that. Uh, we see what God says, but then we want to give it our own views, our own interpretations. The Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath, but some say Sunday will do. The Bible said, remember to keep the Sabbath day, holy, day, not just the two hours we meet here, but the entire day is holy, sacred, where God says, you shall not buy, nor sell, nor do any of your joyful de 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 desire. This is my day. But yet we have our different interpretations. The Bible says, don't marry or date somebody of your different faith. But our own interpretations is that he or she is a nice person. They'll come around. The Bible says don't, 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 don't make any markings on your body or piercings on your body. But we say it's just a little bit. It's a Bible verse that I'm putting on myself. So it's the, it's the Word of God. But yet the Bible is clear. 
in what it tells us. Nebuchadnezzar decided on his own to make what God said fit his desires. And the image, of, and the image then comes out, what? All gold. To fit his desires. And if that wasn't enough, look at verse 2. Daniel chapter 3, verse 2. If that wasn't enough that he changed the, the, the interpretation, and sometimes we are guilty of that. In verse 2, it says, And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the, the magistrates, and all the, and all the officials of the province of, to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. In verse 5, He's, then he says that, and that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, and all the music, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It wasn't enough that he changed the interpretation, but now he wants others to agree with his interpretation. He wants others to think like him and to worship only him. Behind forced worship is a desire to make others believe what you believe. Behind, some, behind forcing someone to worship is the desire to make them think like you think. And we, as Seventh-day Adventists, we disapprove forced worship. Amen? God says, who, he who is willing, come. We invite, we appeal, we call. But we never force. In the same way, friends, in the same way, we should give just how we support and believe strongly and in biblical, in religious liberty, we should give the liberty of others in worshiping how they choose to. We can get into many discussion groups as far as what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, but the basis is we need to respect how others like to worship. Some like to raise their hands for worship. Well, there's biblical support for that. You don't want to raise your hand? Don't raise your hands. But don't be like Nebuchadnezzar and saying, you have to do it how I do it. You have to worship how I think you should worship. That's not worship. This is worship. Are we guilty of that, friends? And so that's why we should, just how we want others to give us liberty on what day we worship and how we come to worship and praise God, we should give the liberty to others. If they don't want to worship on the seventh day, that is their choice. If they don't want to say amen, that is their choice. but we still owe it to love them as brothers and sisters in Christian love. Amen. Amen. Following Jesus, friends, is something serious, as you see here in the text in verse 6. After Nebuchadnezzar, you know, wanted them to force, you worship my way. In verse 6, it says, And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately, not the next day, not next week, immediately, immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Following Christ, being a Christian, is something serious. I know of young people who have missed their graduation, high school and university, because it fell on the Sabbath. And they decided not to go to a secular event because this is the Lord's Day. That's something serious. They settled for
for re receiving their diploma in the mail. I know of a young person who, who broke a relationship because their boyfriend did not want to believe or study Adventist theology. When I worked at Walmart here in Burleson while I was going to Southwestern um, during my last years there at, at Southwestern, I worked as a, as a, uh, as a cashier. And cashiers uh, make the most money apart from managers. And so it, it was with the agreement that I would not sell alcohol or tobacco. And at that time, that Walmart did not sell alcohol because of the high school that's so close to it. Now they worked a way around it, and they do. And so it was with that agreement, and they didn't sell alcohol, and there was only one aisle where they sold tobacco, aisle 17. And so they just told me, well, she'll never put you in that register. And sometimes you would have customers come in and say, oh, I need a pack of marble light. And I said, you're in the wrong aisle. You got to go somewhere else. No, but you, you can go get it for me. I said, no, I can't. You got to go to aisle 17. Or you can take a step and quit if you like. <laughs> but there did come a time where they worked <laughs> around it and did begin to sell alcohol. And that is sold on any register. And so I went and see, you know, see what I can do. They can transfer me somewhere else. So we, got no, we, got, we have nothing else to do. I can, I can unload. Nope, we, we don't need unloaders. And they were kind enough not to, not to let me go. They, and they told me, if you want to stay, you got to go outside and push carts. Because you see, friends, I remembered this little certificate. Does this look familiar? Your baptismal certificate. And God reminded me and put it in my head we're here in one of the commitments that we make to God. And I'm talking about following Christ is something serious. One of the commitments that I committed to I believe that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and will honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, or sell of alcohol beverages, the use, manufacture, or sell of tobacco in any of its forms. And so I had to be content. If I'm going to push carts, I'll push carts. And I push carts in the hot and in the cold. <laughs> and then there was an opening in the furniture department later on where they transferred me. But around that time, I was graduating and almost leaving. Anyone, friends, anyone can be an Adventist when it's convenient. Amen. When it's convenient, there's no obstacles, there's no challenges, there's no trials. Anyone can be an Adventist. But here in Daniel chapter 3, I like these verses. Look, look at verse 14. Daniel chapter 3. These three Hebrew boys would not budge and stood for God, and Nebuchadnezzar couldn't believe it. In verse 14, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God or worship the, God, the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the, the sound of the horn, and he gives them a second try, a second chance, a second try. But he still warns them, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king in verse 16, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this manner. If that is the case, 
our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But verse 18, the first three words are my favorite in this story. But if not, what are they saying? God can deliver us. Sure he can. But if he doesn't, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Amen. Man. But if not, friends, I hope that those words are engraved in your brain. I cannot work on the Sabbath. And God can give me a new job. But if not, I'm still not going to come in on the Sabbath. I can't take that test. Can you schedule me for another day? You see, those hours are sacred hours between my Lord and I. And God can provide for me to take the test on a different day. But if not, I won't take it. I can't hold, I can't, I can't hold on to my ties. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need it to fill in the little expenses. But I know God can provide. So I will give my tithe an offering. But if not, if God doesn't provide, I'm still going to be faithful to him. Anyone who will survive through the last days will stop leaning on their own thoughts and only depending on God's words and God's provision, friends. I cannot say how many, I have it written down in a journal of prayers that God had answered. While I was going to Southwestern, there were times that I was tempted to give or not return our tithe. Our two little ones were little ones. And toddlers and babies are expensive. But God provided, friends. There were miracle after miracle. One of them that I cannot stop sharing is that our church from, that we came from, from the Bronzeville Spanish Church, sent us an offering, a donation. And it came in the mail right at the time that we needed to pay our water bill. For those that live in King, you know your water bill is going to be expensive. And so it just took my wife and I to our knees that God came through. And if you think about it, now I know how churches work and how boards work. That check wasn't written the day before. God impressed in their minds the months before to bring it up at the board meeting. Hey, I wonder how the Charles are doing. Should we give them a love offering? We didn't need it a month ago, but God knew we would have. God knew also that I would be begging and crying, what are we doing with this water bill? And he, he impressed a month ago the church board and the treasurer, and it came in right at the time. But even if it would not have come in, friends, even if, but if God would not have provided, friends, we're okay without water for a couple of days. Amen. We had good neighbors, those who know the Sipo family, Sipo and Nancy, are very good friends and, have provi and would have provided the water that we would have needed. But praise God for his provision. Anyone who will survive to the last days, friends, will stop leaning on their own thoughts, on their own interpretations, and only depend on God's word and his provision. 
The image of Nebuchadnezzar is a symbol of self-worship. The image of Nebuchadnezzar, the gold one, is a symbol of self-worship. And so I just ask myself and you, what is your image? Do you have an image? Whenever we give our opinion that contradicts what the Bible says, we are setting up an image. Whenever God says no and we say yes, whenever God says turn right and we turn left, we are setting up an image. The Bible does talk about a system, a church, that makes an image to the beast. And Pastor Michael will talk about that tonight at 5 o'clock. Come back to hear about that. And at Seventh-day Adventist, we spend a lot of time pointing to the beast and false church in Revelation 13. And yes, that is part of the prophecy. Absolutely. But don't miss the point. Whenever God says something and we say something else, we are setting up an image of self-worship. An image of self, an image of our opinion, an image of pride. Proverbs 16, verse 5 says, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. When God says no and we say yes, when God says stop and we go, when God says anything and we change it, at that moment, we bowed our knee to the image of self. At that, at that moment, we bowed our knee to whatever image it is. It is important, friends, to be informed about prophecy. It is. But don't be concerned to the point that you're missing the image that you set up that needs to be removed. Standing on God's word will be less and less popular in this world. Standing on a thus says the Lord will be less popular. And at some times, even among our church. Amen. But you stand on God's word regardless. If it's popular or not. Maybe along the way you've made some images. The pressure to go against our inclination is difficult, friends. But praise God, I can do all things through Christ because he gives me the strength. Amen. Amen. Just as these three boys stood firm and not worshipped someone else's interpretation of Scripture, I encourage you to stand on the Word of God when others are influencing their interpretation. For standing on the Word of God, you may go through a fiery furnace. You may. I should even say, you will. The Bible says, those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. It's a promise. That's okay, because this isn't our home. We're just passing through. And don't forget, who was in the fiery furnace when they stood firm for God? Jesus himself was right there. Never forget that you are not alone. God will stand with you. One of my favorite promises is in 1 Samuel 2.30. God says, for those who honor me, I will honor. Stand for God, and God will stand for you. Amen. That simple. You stand for God, and God will stand for you. Look at the meditation in your bulletin. As we are closing here, taken from Council for the Church, page 132. By the grace of Christ, you can gain the victory over self and selfishness. Amen. Amen. Not by my works, not by my efforts, by the grace of Christ. You and I can gain the victory over self and selfishness as you live his life showing sacrifice at every step, constantly revealing a stronger sympathy for those in need of help. You will gain victory after victory. Day by day, 
you will learn better how to conquer self and how to strengthen your weak points of character. The Lord Jesus will be your light. Amen. The Lord Jesus will be your light. He will be your strength, your crown of rejoicing, because what? You yield your will to His will. Because you yield your will to His will. So friends, I encourage you. We are living in the last days. And even if we weren't, who's to say that today isn't my last day? I just want to encourage you, friends, as these Hebrew boys, young and faithful, it doesn't matter if you're young or older, we should stand on a thus says the Lord, and not so much, we can be, we can be, I should say, impressed with God's work and His miracle and provision. But being impressed isn't enough. We need to be okay and committed to whatever He says. To whatever He says. So I just appeal and ask, is there anyone who wants to stand with God? If you want to stand with God, I invite you to stand with God. And not just to stand with God, friends, but willing to stand continually with God. You're standing right now. It's exactly 12 o'clock. Will you stand in two hours, continually standing with God? Do you want to stand tomorrow with God? Monday, Tuesday, every single day. Not just here while we're in the sanctuary but continually standing for God. Sometimes we may not understand why God allows things. Sometimes we may question His will, but you can never question His goodness. And God, as He has said, for those who honor me, I will honor. Test Him, and He will. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God Almighty, thank you very much for the example of these young men who stood regardless of the outcome, who stood knowing that you could deliver them, but if not, they were still going to stand. They were willing to sacrifice their lives. Help us to have that faith that we are willing to sacrifice our lives, to sacrifice our jobs, to sacrifice relationships, to sacrifice whatever it may be. Lord, I ask in a special way that you please be with every person here standing or if they're sitting. May your Holy Spirit continue to, to build them up, to give them courage, the willingness to follow you, to stand for you, regardless of the consequences. We know that hard times are coming, and some of us may be in hard times right now. So please give us the strength that we need to continue, the commitment that we need to continue, but above all, the faithfulness also to continue he who endures to the end shall be saved be with your church here in cleveland that we may endure and your church around the world as well in jesus name i pray amen amen, amen. please remember